Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas Everywhere you go Take a look in five and ten Listening once again There's a lot of things that I could say about Christmas that I haven't said yet, but I was reading Isaiah in the uh, Jewish Bible, the Old Testament, and Isaiah 54.5, it is written, God is, God is your husband. It says, For thy maker is thy husband. It's an interesting statement. Because many people feel, not that they're single, but that they're alone. Many people feel isolated and, and alone. And the, the more we've cut ourselves off from God, the more God has been cut out of America by the ACLU and the atheists, the more isolated and lonely people feel. And yet, if you look in the Bible, you find out that they have nothing to say with th these people, these nobodies, these atheists, these anti-Americans, these freaks, in other words, these anti-Christian freaks in particular. They have no power over you. None whatsoever. God hasn't disappeared. They made you think God disappeared. What, because they took it down from a, a, a saying somewhere on a wall? God is still there. God is your husband. And you think, well, I'm alone. I'm lonely. There's no one out there for me. Many people are very lonely around the holidays because they, they're afflicted by, by a loneliness. They think everyone's against them. And they go crazy. There's a high degree of, uh, of uh, anguish around the holidays, as you well know, because people expect things that aren't aren't in their lives, they want a better relationship, they want a family that never happened, or the family fell apart, people got sick and died on them, they remember back to an idealized childhood that may or may not really have existed in their head, but that's the beauty of mind and memory, which is that we make the desolation of our mind into a fertile plane, that is the beauty of memory, is that we can alter a desolate childhood into something different, and that's beautiful, it's not, it's not called fake, it's not called, a, it's not called faking it. And so all I'm going to say to you is that uh, the world is what it's always been. It hasn't really changed at the end of the day. It's man alone, born alone and dies alone, and there's only one way out of it. And you know the way out of it, don't you? Which is the straight way, the straight and narrow way. Otherwise, you're finished. Just guarantee you, as tough as it is, core everybody wants to remain wild and crazy to their last days. It doesn't work. It's just not the way it works. Let it snow, let it snow, let I it promised snow. you I would uh, try to do Man, my special shows no for each day of the week, and today's specialty and is going to be on ethnic foods. Bubble. Many of you consider yourself proud of your low. ethnic heritage, and I'm going to talk about what it really means, and I'm going to ask you some questions. What ethnic foods did you eat in your family as you were growing up? And what was the most disgusting ethnic food your parents made you eat as a child? <laughs> And did you see members of your family experiencing health problems as a result of eating so-called traditional ethnic foods? Those are some of the things you can call about, because I think it'll be fun. But I want to now go back to a book I wrote. It's not available. It's not for sale. I am not selling books. Unlike um, Wallbanger, unlike uh, the Marjo with the blackboard, this book was written in 1981. It's called The Skeptical Nutritionist, The Way of the Skeptical Nutritionist. And Macmillan Publishing published it. It's a little-known book. I may reproduce it, actually, because it's so, it's so ahead of its time. On page six, I talk about food fascism. Did you know that, that even when I was a nutritionist, I was already into uh, this? Here's what I wrote. The bookstores are lined with correct diets for the unmet masses. Social engineers, having arranged our personal lives from sexual behavior to dying, have been aided in applying their golden rules to our last frontier food. Food fascism, like other varieties of the social disease, requires lieutenants to proselytize. Not wishing to participate in any form of totalitarianism, I wrote, I intend not to dictate a correct diet for a fictional reader. Now, I wrote this back in the early 80s. So you could see I was already quite political, even though I was in the field of medical, uh, in nutrition and health and whatnot. Now, having said that, I want to go into something else in this book, because I think you'll find it very, very interesting. And it's about ethnic foods and the ethnic factor and things like that. And I want to show you how important this is, what happens to people when they shift their diets from their really traditional diets, from their authentic original diets, 
to some Western-style diet, what happens to them? I'm going to give you an example, and it's found on page 30 of The Way of the Skeptical Nutritionist. Again, it's not available for sale. Maybe you could find it used. You know that some of my used books are selling for hundreds of dollars? I was shocked. I went on Amazon, and my book, Healing Children Naturally, in the original version, is going up to 140 bucks. But anyway, look what I wrote. An example of disease states that can be induced. Okay, let's, uh, let, let's start from the top. Are you worried about diabetes? Has your doctor told you it's related to diet and exercise? Or just put you on a little pill? Listen to one paragraph. An example of disease states that can be induced as a result of severe and dramatic dietary changes can be found amongst the Yemenite Jewish people. For example, the Kurds and Yemenites who came to Israel had rates of diabetes as low as the Eskimos of Iceland and Greenland, 0.3 per thousand. Both groups lived in an isolated geographical situation with little contact with Western lifestyle, including diets. Soon after settling in areas where Western habits and diets prevail, a sharp rise in the prevalence of diabetes is noted. This is held up by a study done by A.M. Cohen in 1958, who compared the rates of occurrence in four Jewish ethnic groups in Israel based on the father's place of birth. These were Sephardic, Ashkenazi, Yemenite, and Kurdish communities. The study sample was composed of nearly 16,000 people, half males, half females, and their age distribution resembled that of the general Israeli population. Now listen to the rest of this. Even, let's say, it doesn't matter whether you're Jewish or not. If you can draw any conclusion from this, it may help you avoid diabetes. Listen. Interestingly, the lowest rates of diabetes mellitus were seen among Yemenite newcomers, 0.06%, followed by the Sephardic people, 1%, while the old Yemenite settlers had the highest rate, 2.9%, even higher than that of Ashkenazi Jews, at 2.5%. So what is this all about? Dr. Goodman cites an animal experiment conducted in 1964 in which sand rats were transferred from their natural desert habitat to a laboratory environment. The rats that were transferred and their first-generation offspring exhibited inappropriate hyperglycemia associated with obesity and diabetes. Subsequent generations tended to adapt to lab conditions and displayed mild or no hyperglycemia. Here's the last line. In man, however, these adaptations do not occur as readily, as evidenced by the higher rate of diabetes among second-generation Israelis. So what did I just tell you? I just told you that in one example, diabetes rates rose when traditional people moved to Israel where the Western diet quite, was quite prevalent, and once they started eating high fat, High sugar diets, they started to develop uh, high rates of diabetes mellitus. Did you know that? And so, therefore, I'm telling you that it's very important you understand who you are ethnically, what your genetic uh, composition may be, to help you uh, uh, understand how you may have adapted wrongly to Western civilization, not only in terms of your diet, but in terms of everything else. Now, I don't expect you to change your life. When I explain to you what the ethnic factor is, I'm not going to devise a pellet containing all known and all suspected required nutrients for each ethnic group in America. I mean, very nice. Here's your Italian pellet. Here's your Irish pellet. I want to shift, though, to something entirely different. We're living in interesting times where each man literally has to save himself. We have no authority figures to believe in. We have no government to believe in. That's why I wrote Government Zero, and it's not an infomercial. Government zero, no borders, no language, no culture. And I made a commitment, which I should repeat right now. All of the royalties that I make on that book will be given to my Savage Scholarship Fund for deserving college students going forward. That will be one of the things I leave as my legacy after my radio career. Savage. The Bible is a very complicated book. It's not just about resisting temptation. There are a lot of prohibitions in the Bible, particularly for religious Jews who can't eat certain foods, uh, certain kosher foods you can eat, uh, non-kosher foods you can't eat, certain animals you can't eat, certain animals you can't eat. It's extremely complicated. I don't know if you people know it. The average person, if they're at all religious, tries to follow the Ten Commandments, which unto itself is very hard when you consider what's in there. The Orthodox Jew has to follow 313 commandments or 330-some-odd commandments. Who can do all of that? Who can remember all of that? And so you look at the, the religion of Islam, 
And the Muslim has many of the same prohibitions as the Orthodox Jew does. So I'll make it simple. For example, the Orthodox Jew won't eat pork or pig. And the Muslim won't eat pork or pig. Why? Because if you look at Leviticus 11, there's a whole list of foods you can animals you can eat and animals you can't eat. I can't read every one of them, but it's really, it runs for two pages. Can you believe it? These are the living things which you may eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof, the hoof, and is wholly cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud, you can eat. Nevertheless, these you should not eat. Of them that only chew the cud, or of them that only part the hoof. The camel you can't eat, because he cheweth the cud, and but parteth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. Now, why would the Bible, why would the ancient Israelites be told not to eat the camel? Well, would you eat your Chevy Tahoe? It was transportation. I mean, you could argue that the rules were written some ways to avoid eating your transportation if you wanted to be sarcastic. But it gets more complicated because the next one says, And the rock badger you can't eat because he cheweth the cud, but parteth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. So what's the prohibition on a rock badger? What do they care about a rock badger to keep it alive? Then it says you can't even eat a rabbit. Why couldn't the ancient Jew eat the rabbit? It says, and the hare, because she cheweth the cud, but parteth not the hoof. She is unclean unto you. Well, the Italians eat the, the hare. And uh, and the swine, because he parteth the hoof and is cloven-footed, but cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. Of their flesh you should not eat, and their carcasses you should not touch. They are unclean unto you. Then what about in the, the fish in the water? Jews can't eat shrimp. Jews can't eat, you wouldn't know that, of course, going to it. There was a smorgasbord in Florida. Jews can't eat shrimp or lobster. Go tell them that down in the in west in Boca Raton. These may eat all that are in the waters whatsoever has fins and scales in the season and the rivers you can eat. But all have not fins and scales in the season and the rivers and all the swarm in the waters and of all the living creatures that are in the waters. They are a detestable thing unto you. And they shall be a detestable thing unto you. You shall not eat of their flesh and their carcasses you shall have in te- detestation. Whatever has no fins nor scales in the waters, that is a detestable thing unto you. Right? And what about in the air? And these you shall have in detestation among the fowls. They shall not be eaten. They are a detestable thing. The great vulture, so you can't eat vulture. The bearded vulture. The osprey, the kite, the falcon. The raven, the ostrich, the night hawk, the sea mew, the hawk, the little owl, and the cormorant, and the great owl, and the horned owl, and the pelican, and the carrion vulture, and the stork, and the heron. And the hoopoo and the bat, you can't eat them. I don't know why. What about creatures that crawl on the ground? All winged, swarming things that go upon all fours are a detestable thing unto you. And he lists the ones, or they list the ones you can eat. But listen to what you can eat. You don't even know this. Uh, attention, Orthodox Jews. Even these of them you may eat, the locust after its kinds, and the bald locust, and the cricket, and the grasshopper. So you're allowed to actually have a grasshopper stew if you're a Jewish person. Or if you really want to go into the Bible, you can have a little locust uh, dessert, a little locust ice cream. Why? Well, it's very interesting because when I studied nutrition, I found out that not only were these great famine foods, grasshoppers are very high in protein, incidentally. The poor Africans, after uh, you know living in drought, sometimes they have nothing to eat but the locust and the grasshopper, and it keeps them alive. It's a very high source of protein. But all winged swarming things which have four feet are a detestable thing unto you. And they go in to the whole deal. You can't eat carrion. you right. And whatsoever goes on its paws among all beasts that go on all fours that they are unclean unto you. Whoso touch their carcass shall be unclean unto them. And he that beareth the carcass of them shall wash his clothes. Blah, blah, blah. So you go on to the whole thing. I'm not going to read all of it. It's very interesting stuff. It's long. It's long stuff. And then it gets down to the swarming thing. You can't eat them. You cannot eat liberals because it says, Whatsoever goeth upon the belly, and whatsoever goeth upon all fours, and whatsoever hath many feet, even all swarming things that swarm upon the earth, them ye shall not eat. So you can't eat any liberals, I'm sorry, for they are a detestable thing. You should not make yourself, <laughs> you shall not make yourself detestable with any swarming thing that swarmeth, neither shall you make. So you see what I'm getting at? It's very complicated. This is the law of the beast and of the fowl and of every living creature that moveth in the waters and of every creature that swarmeth upon the earth to make a difference between the unclean and the clean and between the living thing that may be eaten and the living thing that may not be eaten. Let's close the book and now let's use.